so what is the biblical teaching about hell? Is hell some dark cavern somewhere deep in the earth? Is a loving God punishing humans in hell today and forever? What is unquenchable fire? Some of you may ask, isn't that what the Bible says? And what about the everlasting fire? Doesn't the Bible teach that? So let's clarify this hell conspiracy once and for all. And before we get to this uh, lesson on hell, it is important to summarize the previous lesson just very briefly. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching this and you haven't seen lesson number two of the upstream Bible study, I would like to encourage you to click on the link and watch that study because without lesson number two, you may not completely understand the lesson on hell fire because these two are connected. Because you see, the Bible speaks of death as a sleep. The Bible tells us at least 53 times declares death to be asleep, both in the Old and the New Testament. And yes, there is life eternal. And the Bible says that this life eternal will be given to us at the last trumpet when Jesus Christ comes back the second time. And once again, Paul says we will not all sleep, but we will be changed at the last trumpet in the twinkling of an eye. And only then the perishable will clothe itself with the imperishable and mortal with immortality. So right now, according to the Bible, the people who have died, even the saints who have died, they are not in heaven with the exception of some who have been resurrected. One of them is Moses. And last time we also discussed that there was a special resurrection after the death of Christ. But for the rest of the people, the Bible says that they are sleeping like King David. He's sleeping. The Bible even says that King David is, is dead and buried and he did not ascend into heavens. The same thing is with the first martyr, Stephen. He is sleeping as he was stoned to death. He fell asleep. And even Daniel, the great prophet, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. And God, especially to Daniel, he even told him when. He says, Daniel, you will rest, but at the end of the days, you will rise. And so, folks, uh, this is not something new. I do not stand alone. The Protestant reformers like Martin Luther, they discovered this teaching in the Bible. I should say rediscovered because early Christians already believed in this doctrine. And Martin Luther, he believed that when he dies, he would be sleeping, not going straight to heaven. A well-known Bishop Eusebius, one of uh, the earliest Christian historians, he clearly says in the book that is 1,700 years old, he says, great saints sleep in Asia who shall rise again when? On the last day. At the Lord's advent, when he shall come with glory from heaven and call back all his saints. And that's why today's topic is extremely important as you understand what is what death is. Because you see... According to the Bible, if you die, you simply fall asleep. But if you teach and you understand the biblical doctrine of death differently, and we know that most pagan religions believe that when you die, you don't really die. And that's why the concept of hell has been completely misunderstood. And so there is a conspiracy against God's character because three things we need to know tonight. Number one is that God is not a destroyer. Somebody can say amen to that. Satan is. God is not a destroyer. God is not to blame for sin and suffering. Satan is. God does not burn people in hell forever and ever. That is satanic propaganda. Folks, that is the propaganda. If you think that people who have died, let's say the bad ones, that they are in hell, you literally believe in the immortality of the soul. And that is not biblical. That comes from pagan religions. And uh, the very first lie about death was already spoken by Satan. Did God say that you will die? No, he says you will not die. And so 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says the following. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is our heavenly father. He is a loving God. He says, I don't want anybody to perish. I don't want any, no one to perish. I want everyone to come to repentance. My friend, there is a good news. The good news is that God is merciful and patient and kind. At the same time, the Bible also says that this loving God is also a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. 
But you will say, wait a minute, but the Bible does speak of, of a fiery hell. And is there a doctrine of fiery hell in the Bible? And let's go to that, those passages in the book of Matthew chapter 13. Actually, Jesus himself has a lot to say about the hellfire. And I want you to be patient because I don't want you to just to suddenly turn your screen off or turn your YouTube video off because you probably already concluded, well, God is such a tyrant and there's going to be hellfire. I'm not listening anymore. You will be quite surprised at the end of this presentation if you're patient. So let's read Matthew chapter 13. And it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and he went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? And Jesus says, An enemy did this, he replied. And then let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. I'm glad that God gives an explanation to this parable. And starting with Matthew 13, verse 37, Jesus explains, and he says, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels. All right. So when will the judgment be? At the end of the age. And now Jesus goes even further. And he says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. And friends, we could stop right here and say our Bible study is over. It's very clear that there is no hell fire somewhere in the middle of Russia, as some YouTube YouTubers claim that there is a hole dug deep somewhere in Russia, and they placed a microphone down the tube, and they hear the screams from hell. Well, friends, this is not biblical. The Bible says there is no hell fire right now, but there will be fire when at the end of the age. Now, this is Jesus himself speaking. And we're going to go and discuss this a little bit more because there's more passages and more questions. One of them is this. Didn't the Bible say that this will be an eternal fire? Doesn't the Bible say that? And let's go to that passage in Matthew chapter 25. Again, we're going to see what Jesus says about hellfire. And this is what Jesus says. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And folks, some of you may say, well, there it is. It says eternal fire. But I want to tell you that it is the punishment that is eternal and everlasting, not the punishing itself. The consequences of that punishment will be eternal, but the punishing is not going to be eternal because God is a God of love. He's a God of justice. Yes, like a loving father, he will bring justice, but the punishing is not going to be forever and ever. And I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible. Let's go to Jude and verse 7. And this is what it says there about the end times and how it's going to happen. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So friends, according to the Bible, we know that there were two cities in the Bible and they were destroyed with eternal fire. The question, of course, people are asking is Sodom and Gomorrah. Probably some of you never heard of this. And let's go to Genesis chapter 19 um, and verse 17. Sodom and Gomorrah, these two cities were filled with all kinds of violence. All kinds of violence to the point where even when the angels came to visit the city, the angry mob wanted to sexually assault even the angels now this is this is how society can become so corrupt you know the condition of people's minds are so far away from god that the devil takes control of their minds completely and the bible says that when the angels saw that they said to lot and his family they said escape for your life do not look behind you 
nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. And the, then the Bible says in Genesis 19, verse 24, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And of course, if you go to Sodom and Gomorrah today, you will not find any cities, but archaeologists do find the ruins of an ancient city of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the question is, is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? And what is the answer? The answer is no. Even though the Bible says that these two cities were destroyed with what kind of fire? Eternal fire. But is it eternally burning right now? The punishing, the process, was it eternal? No. But it has eternal consequences. That's why the Bible clearly says that those cities will uh, are destroyed. They're not to be rebuilt. And here you can see the ashes. Archaeologists find uh, this fiery destruction, such as this layer of ash in the Western Temple and the tumbled walls also attest to an earthquake. And folks, as we read the Bible, when Jesus comes, there is also going to be a powerful earthquake in addition to fire coming down from heaven, eternal fire. But the fire will not be burning forever. It is going to be just for a moment. Now, the Bible doesn't say for how long the Sodom and Gomorrah were burning, but we know that the destruction was complete. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Later, God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into heaps of ashes and swept them off the face of the earth. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. Friends, I know this may be very difficult for you to read. And trust me, as I'm reading this, could it be that a, a God of love can do this? Could it be that a God of love who says that God is love can, can do this kind of punishment? And that's why the Bible say, says that this will be a very strange act for God to do. Very strange. This will be for the first time in the history of heavens that sin will have to be destroyed. But God cannot force. God cannot force his qualities, his peace, uh, the principles of the kingdom on anyone. And so people have a choice. And people, people of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, they had a choice. They had a, a godly man living among them. They've heard the preaching, the, the sermons about God and his kingdom. The question is, how many people follow the gospel? The sad reality is that even his own wife did not listen to the counsel. The Bible says, said to them, go and run away. Do not even look back because you will not survive the fire. And we know that the spouse turned into a pillar of salt just by looking back, looking back at the fire. So this is not just an ordinary fire, folks. This is some kind of supernatural fire that burned for maybe, uh, I don't know, a moment, a few seconds, maybe a few minutes, but it's not burning there today. So this is what is going to happen at the end of the days not now so the hell conspiracy has been resolved right here and right now there is no hellfire burning torturing people forever and ever that would be completely contradictory to god's character we are horrified with all the violence and destruction that for example hitler brought on this planet and some of those fascists and nazis have been brought to justice and some of them were taken through the courts and the final decision was to destroy them. But no one in their right mind made a decision to torture those even Nazi soldiers for all the years in jail. That would be completely contrary to even humanity, even in the secular world. So why would Christians think that God, a loving God, would torture people forever and ever? It's just not possible and it's not true. And that's why Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, verse 43, if your hand causes you to sin, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. And we're going to go to the question about the unquenchable fire because somebody says, well, there it is. It says unquenchable. That must mean it's burning. But be careful, folks. Even here, there, is, there are examples in history of some people who have taken God's word to extremes. For example, Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Does it mean it literally? I mean, folks, if you 
there, there in history, there is one man by the name of Dracula. Now today there is horror movies about him. Dracula, the vampire, supposedly from Transylvania. Did you know that Dracula was a real king who lived in Transylvania? He was Christian. But the reason he has such bad reputation, because he read the same passage and he decided that if anyone would steal something in his kingdom, he was going to take it literally. He believed that when Jesus says, cut it off, he meant, he, that, that meant that if you stole something, he would cut off your hands. And if, um, and if you lied, he would cut your tongue off. That was, that's what Dracula was famous for. And guess what? If you would uh, commit adultery, guess what? He would cut off next. So you had to be watch out, watching out for Dracula back in Romania, there in Transylvania. But you see how people can take the Bible and misunderstand and take it to extremes. Whether it's eternal fire or whether it's, you know, cut off your hand. You know, and that's why often people who are unstable, as the Bible says, twist God's word to their own destruction. All right. Jesus doesn't say you have to literally cut off your hand, but what he means is that if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off in your mind. In your mind, you have to say no to sin. That means not visiting certain places, not watching certain things. Uh, I don't know what you are going through and what is keeping you from God's kingdom, folks, but you know, whatever it is, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. There's nothing in this world that should separate us from eternity. And so uh, unquenchable fire. Some people say, well, there it is. It says unquenchable. That means unstoppable. So what do you mean, pastor? Well, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. And very clearly there uh, it explains. It says, but if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day by not carrying any load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortress. Now remember, Jeremiah was a prophet, and he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. And just like as Jeremiah wrote, Jerusalem was destroyed. As a matter of fact, Jerusalem was just destroyed several times. But the question is, since Jerusalem was destroyed by fire, and the Bible says it was destroyed by unquenchable fire, is Jerusalem still burning today? Take a look at this picture, and you will realize that no, Jerusalem is not burning today. So the unquenchable simply meant for a certain period of time, which meant unstoppable. That didn't mean forever or eternal, but unstoppable. And that's why in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. Folks, the main point of God is that God says, Watch out, humanity, because the day is coming when I will put an end to evil. Who wants to say amen to that? I'm going to bring justice. Who wants to say amen today? How much injustice there is in this world. God says, I'm going to put an end to injustice and all the evil. And you have a chance to make your decision today. Today. Because God is merciful and loving. He doesn't want anybody to to die or perish. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 says, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. And then it says, Not a root or a branch will be left to, of them. So obviously, this eternal fire is not burning eternally, but it has eternal consequences. And the Bible speaks of the first and second death. And the second death will be this, this, this fire that will destroy evil, including Satan and his angels. And it will, be, it will have eternal consequences. But after that, fire will stop. Not a root or branch will be left of them. And the book of Psalms says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. Obadiah even says, And they shall be as though they had never been. Oh, friends, the day is coming. And right now I'm sharing some images, and I'm going to be very sensitive. I know that there may be some children that are watching this Bible study. But these are images from my native home 
my native country of Ukraine. This is what's happening there in the last 48 hours. There are stories of families who are trying to escape. And, uh, and it's difficult for me even to speak. But families who try to escape, but suddenly all of them perish in, in just one blast. And this may not be the exact vehicle that was described in, described in the story, but so far, already thousands of casualties in Ukraine because of this senseless war. People's lives have been destroyed. This, is, this happened in the last 24 hours. An entire apartment building, you can see, was totally destroyed with a missile. Even though Mr. Putin says that he is not targeting civilians, but today civilians are suffering the most. And interestingly, most, you know, it is the Russian speaking citizens of Ukraine that, that right now are being killed the most. Because remember, his pretext for invading Ukraine was to say he is coming because there are Nazis in Ukraine. <laughs> Even though he himself is acting like one by killing thousands of lives, including those who speak Russian. And just for the record, the president of Ukraine is Jewish. It's a Jewish president with Jewish roots, Jewish mother. And so people's lives are devastated. One million refugees fleeing Ukraine to neighboring countries. As a native Ukrainian, I'm sure everybody in this world, the United Nations have been, have united in a voice of condemnation of the senseless act. And, uh, and just like God right now is patient with all this evil, but I believe United Nations, including United States, are considering an option of stopping this evil of stopping Russia right now because it seems like Vladimir Putin is considering even the nuclear option right now. And the bomb that is, that is nuclear is called Satan. How symbolic. The president of Russia's, his biggest nuclear arsenal is called Satan. And so this loving God says, I will have to put a stop because if I don't, no one will survive, the Bible says. So as strange as this may seem, that a loving God can sound, suddenly say, stop, enough. But isn't that what you do as a loving parent, my friend? Isn't that what you do when your kids misbehave? That yes, you, you love them, but at the same time, as a loving father and mother, you will also correct them. And you will also punish them. Teaching him that there are consequences to his actions. And folks, we're not talking about here child abuse. And we know we live in Canada and, and, you know, for example, spanking is totally illegal. But, you know, the Bible actually already contradicts the secular notion. It says that a loving father does not spare the rod. The Bible actually says that. And I know when we here in Canada, we, 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 we kind of are horrified at this. But, you know, when I had a father, when, when my dad was alive, and unfortunately, my dad is not here anymore. But my dad used to tell me, Marion, if, if I catch you smoking cigarettes, I will kill you. And I'm not even exaggerating. That's exactly what he told me. And down deep inside, I knew that my father really meant it because he, he shared with me the horrific stories of many of my family members who have been killed because of cigarette smoke and alcohol. And he said the same thing about Alpi. If I catch you drinking alcohol, Marion, that'll be the end of your life. But you know... <laughs> I am thankful that my loving father warned me in such, a, in such stern words because I knew he meant business. And I wanted to obey just because I knew he cared. That's the kind of father I had. And Francis Ezekiel says, For I have no pleasure in the death of, of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Turn and live. And that's why Isaiah chapter 55 says, Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And that's why today I want to just tell you, I'm still learning as a father with my kids. But I, before I punish my kids, I, I always explain to them. I say, well, my, my friends, you just did this and I want you to think about the consequences. What do you think I should do? And of course, my kids say, forgive us, forgive us. I said, okay, well. But I want to warn you, if, if I see you do this again, you know, being disrespectful or 
or being rough with each other. If I see this again, that there will be more severe consequences. And so God is not just someone who just comes and punishes. God says, I want everybody to live because I'm a God of mercy. I'm not here to be a God who just is angry with you and just cannot wait to destroy you. No, it's the opposite. God says, I love you. I want you to repent. And so Satan is the one who is trying to portray God as unfair and God who is a tyrant. But see, Satan is a tyrant. Satan is the one who brings evil. And today we have a choice. Do we follow Christ or do we follow Satan? And of course, we want to say we want to follow God. And today I want to appeal to you that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have nothing to be afraid. As a matter of fact, fear is not part of Christian life because love brings freedom. But even Jesus' death on the cross tells us that there are consequences to sin. There's a price to be paid for every sin. And that's why if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says if you want to enter the kingdom, only those who are being born again who have been baptized by the water and the spirit will enter into the kingdom because it has to be your personal choice. And you see, the baptism is a symbol of death. Just like Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says in the book of Romans that just like death on the cross, baptism is also dying to our old self. That's why we are buried uh, through baptism in the watery grave. And then we are raised to new life because that we, in that way, we express our desire to be with God, to live forever, to live a new life. And so is this your desire today? I would like to make an appeal and, and uh, would like to ask if there's anybody who has not been baptized or perhaps you grew up on the, on the teaching that is not even biblical, painting God as a God of tyrant who, who is torturing people day and night forever and ever. And you've realized that that is not biblical. That is, not, that is satanic conspiracy against God. Do you know how many people left the church because of the hell doctrine? Because of the incorrect hell doctrine? Thousands and thousands left the church because they could not reconcile how a loving God would torture somebody forever and ever. Impossible, not unbiblical. And today I'm going to shock you. Are you ready, folks? I'm going to put it on the screens. Are you ready? This is going to be quite shocking. You're going to have maybe a different view of this eternal fire. I, wanna, I want you to fasten your seatbelts because this is going to be so revolutionary for some of you that you will not be able to sleep tonight because you will be so excited <laughs> of what you're just about to learn. So here it is, folks. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says that our God is a consuming fire. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What did you say? That's right, folks. The Bible says that this eternal fire, and of course, we don't even understand it. This supernatural fire is God himself. Now, bear with me. Bear with me because I want to take you through the Bible just quickly. Do you remember when Moses saw the burning bush, but the bush was not being destroyed, but he saw the fire. And then one day Moses even said to God, he said, Lord, I want to see your face. And what did God say to him? If you see my face, you will not survive. Because folks, according to the Bible, with our limited understanding, God is, the, is a hot stuff. His glory is so bright that we would not even survive. And the Bible says in Exodus 24, that even when Israelites were led in the desert, it says the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. But you know, when Jesus came, he limited himself. He was, he limited, he veiled his glory with the bodily flesh. So we could not see his full glory because if we did, we would not survive according to the Bible. So what I'm trying to say, folks, what I'm trying to say is that, is that I believe, now listen carefully, I believe, feel free to correct me. I believe that when Jesus comes the second time, he simply is going to say to humanity, I am the eternal fire. I am that fire because, and I want to come and I want to show my face to the world. And if you have not chosen to live in my kingdom, you will not survive the glory of the kingdom because the darkness of the world, darkness does not survive my presence. In my presence, sin disappears. Sin is destroyed in my presence. That's why Revelation says that people who chose to ignore God and say no to him, they will call out to the mountains and, and rocks and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. For the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand? You see the face of him. 
And that's why Revelation says that God is so bright. Remember, no eye has seen or ear has heard. That's why when we die and when we are resurrected, the Bible says our bodies will change so that we will, we will be able to survive this fire. We will be in the presence of this eternal fire. As a matter of fact, the heavenly city Jerusalem does not need the sun or the moon to shine because the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. Friends, I don't know if you're excited about what you're reading, but then it makes sense that God is not going to bring just some fire to torture people. No. According to the Bible, God himself is the eternal fire. His glory is so bright that when he comes in his presence, and the Bible says that the wickedness will be destroyed in the presence of God. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a beautiful bride prepared for her husband, the Bible says. And then look what happens. This is after a thousand years. This is the second resurrection who have chosen not to follow God and ignore him and say no to his principles. The Bible says that when they will see the heavenly kingdom and God's glory, instead of repenting, instead of saying, I'm sorry, the Bible says that they will be filled with anger together with Satan. They will march across the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire comes down from heaven and devours them. You see, folks, that's what's going to happen at the very end of the days. And I believe that by reading the Bible, this fire, this supernatural fire that's going to come down from heaven is nothing else but the presence of God himself. Because he has a fiery presence. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And then the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now this is another reality of lake of fire and brimstone. Definitely some of these things to us sound like a mystery, folks. But we definitely know. That this is the second death, which means the consequences are eternal. After the second death, there is no more resurrection. People have chosen. There is no coming back, according to the Bible. And that's why in the book of Revelation, it says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And so, friends, I want to end with this slide here. There was one question that was already just, just came to me about rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 and to 31. Here's the question. Doesn't the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 teach an eternal hell of torment? And right from the beginning, I'm going to say, no, this passage does not teach that there is eternal hell fire burning. And I'll prove it to you right now and explain it. Because it is simply a parable used to emphasize a point. You see, a parable is a brief story in prose or verse that illustrates a moral or religious lesson. So if we took parables literally, then we must believe that trees talk. Because according to the book of Judges, there's another parable where trees talk. I mean, having an intelligent conversation. That's just a parable. And uh, that's why people, that's why the Bible says we need to read the Bible with understanding. Now, for example, the parable of a mustard seed, that's a famous parable that was uh, shared by Jesus. And the parable says that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, that when you plant it, it grows into a big, large tree. But did you know that a mustard seed does not grow and turn into a tree? So was Jesus lying? <laughs> and the, the answer, of course, is no, Jesus is not lying. But Jesus is simply speaking a parable. And the main purpose of the parable is to teach a moral lesson. And so that's why trees talk and uh, the mustard seed turns into a tree, even though it's, it's just a plant. It's just a small plant, a mustard seed, okay? In John chapter 10, verse 14, 
It says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Here's another example where Jesus says, I am a shepherd and you are sheep. Are you literally sheep? Well, of course, we, we symbolically understand these, these symbols. And in John chapter 2, it, Jesus told another, you can say, parable. He said to the Pharisees, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, some people said, man, Jesus is crazy. It took many years to build a temple in Jerusalem. How is he going to destroy it and rebuild it in just three days? But uh, they did not understand. But later we realized that they did understand the parable because Jesus was not talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but he was talking about his own body. And by the way, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build the temple and you are going to raise it in three days. And the Bible says, but the temple he had spoken of was his body right there. See, so Jesus speaks to us in parables and we have to understand that. And some of you may say, well, why is Jesus teaching uh, in parables? And disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And Jesus answered, he said, that is why I tell these stories, because people see what I do, but they don't really see it. They hear what I say, but they don't really hear and they don't understand. All right. So in other words, those who really seek after me, they will understand. And that's why in order to understand a parable, you have to read the entire Bible. And only then can you interpret God's word. And so here is an interesting uh, parable of rich man and Lazarus. So let's go to it. It talks about this uh, rich man who was mistreating uh, uh, his servant. And when they died, the rich man ended up in hell. And the poor man who was serving and was treated badly, he ended up in heaven. And then... Uh, he ended up in Abraham's bosom, even said in the, in the parable. But we, also, we, we know very clearly that Abraham's bosom is not in heaven, according to Hebrews chapter 11. We also understand that people in hell, they cannot talk to those in heaven, according to Isaiah 65. And even Revelation, there will be no communication between people who are in hellfire and those in heaven. Number three, the dead according to the Bible, are in their graves. They are not in hell. They're not burning in hell, according to Daniel 12 and John 5. Number four, men are rewarded at Christ's second coming, not at death. Jesus made it very simple. He said very plainly, the hell fires will come when? At the end of the age, after a thousand years. And that'll be the second death. But not now. So rich man is not speaking to, <laughs> to Lazarus, okay? Who was his servant. The lost are punished in hellfire at the end of the world, not when they die. So you say, well, wait a minute. So what's the point of the parable then? And, and the answer is quite simple, folks. What Jesus was trying to tell and to teach is that salvation is not ours by birthright. You see, the people of Israel... They felt very rich and wealthy because they had all the truth, all the doctrines. And just like this rich man in the parable, they had all these riches, but they did not appreciate them. And so salvation is not just by birthright or by the fact that you inherited this wealth. The beggar symbolized the Gentiles who were counted unworthy to receive the truth. This beggar that was at the table of this rich man, who now, according to the parable, was in heaven is simply a symbol who represents the gentiles because you see the gentiles people outside israel they were like beggars because they did not have the bible they did not have the old testament and they were like the beggars because the jews had the truth that's why the woman at the at the well uh, the samaritan woman she said to jesus she says we are beggars at the tables of the jews you see that's what the gentiles felt about themselves compared to the jews we are beggars at the table of the jews and so this is the main lesson of this parable is that the beggar who did not even have the bible but he fed just on the crumbs that fell from the table of the rich and wealthy israel who had all the truth they will end up in heaven and unfortunately those who had all the riches all the truth unfortunately will we will not see them in heaven and that's why the Bible has those sad verses that says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom, but those 
who do the will of my father. So folks, there is no eternal burning hellfire. Those are the popular beliefs, but they are not biblical. I don't know if we have any more questions. The mic is open to you. Um, I, I just uh, I was looking at Revelation 14.10 there. I just threw that in um, where it speaks of uh, um, them being tortured in, in the presence of, of uh, the lamb and the angels. I'd have to look it up here, but that verse has always been somewhat troubling um i've heard that this was a new notion to me like god is a consuming fire i'd heard this a uh, number well it's just several years ago really about you know how, how all will be just consumed away and that that hell is not a place but um there there does see, there are verses where it is a lake of fire and um, again, being tortured in the presence of of the angels and 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 the, the lamb, I, I just thought these are kind of dark uh, images of of uh, hellfire, I guess, and 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 kind of contrary to the character of God. Or I would think I sometimes I have a hard time reconciling that. So I just wondered what your thoughts are were on that. This word tormented you know sometimes we also understand that this is a translation and if you look in the original and i'm looking at it i have it's not because i'm some super smart guy here but i have a software here biblical software that shows me the greek word and the greek word basanizo actually believe it or not the first and most important meaning of the word that is translated as 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 tortured you know it means to to be tested as metal in the fire it's kind of like a positive word but of course we translate it because we have limited you know even with english sometimes uh, you know i cannot even translate a joke from ukrainian to english because it makes no sense but this word in the original greek literally means to be tested like a metal which means that it's positive that's why for the people who have accepted christ this is no torture pastor could you look at um, malachi chapter three Starting at verse 2, it talks about the refiner's fire. So go ahead, read it, Glennis. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of judah and jerusalem will be accepted to the lord as in the days of as in the days gone by as in former years does that explain it better thank you so yeah refiner's fire i was looking for the phrase yeah there it is the bible speaks of of second coming as a refiner's fire so steve what do you think malachi chapter three what, what do you feel when you just read this yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting concept. It was something that I'd heard Ivor Myers preach on, um, you know, God being a consuming fire, and that really it was a it was really like a final act of love, and and uh, I mean only those clothed in His righteousness. I mean, he talks about about it as as being fireproof, you know, like when you've you've chosen to you've chosen the Lord as your savior, and and. And, and accepted his righteousness he's closed as he closed you in his righteousness and thereby you're you're able to even be in his presence to 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 live in in his his presence and i this uh, this idea was beautiful to me that it was really you know he, he doesn't force anyone god doesn't force anyone so finally really as an act of mercy almost he as ivor meyer puts it he he says he gives those who who he who choose not to be in his kingdom really one last final embrace almost but it, it consumes them they are consumed away and it's and it's done out of love it's still out of love so and and i i, I god has to god is love his character has to be out of love so that was the best explanation that i'd ever heard of that but i would still come i still come across these um like ver verses where it seems to be it's torment and torture and and uh 
um, I didn't know how to reconcile some of that. So, mm -hmm. and I still have questions of, well, how is justice, you know, um, served with say, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's seems to me levels of, of sin. I, um, I mean, I guess I had concepts of hell that, you know, yeah, you would, you know, Hitler, let's say, or some people who, who have committed heinous crimes and heinous sins. Like how, how is, how is justice, uh, administered, I guess. And, and, uh, cause he's a, he's a loving God. But he's also a just God. And, and, and so, yeah, the, the, I, I just struggled with that. So I, I trying, trying to have a loving God and yet a just God and some kind of punish it is a punishment there too so i i just i have a hard time reconciling all these concepts sometimes that's my question it remains a question to some point but i i like the i like the different understanding of these words i try to look in the strongs and stuff but i'm sure you have better bible software than i do indeed it's a mystery it's a strange act as the bible says right for god to do this and the and i'm glad that my Heavenly Father is so loving, though, that he, as you said, will have this final embrace of love. Because as I read the Bible, the refiner's fire should be, should be loving. We should be welcoming this eternal fire and looking forward to it, uh, to this existence that is eternal. So help, may God help us to wear this uh, fire protective suit, as you said. That is his righteousness. This, this white robe represents Christ's righteousness, not mine. And so, folks... Heaven is not place for perfect people. Because if we were perfect, that means we would have to make it there with our own righteousness. But that's not what God is asking us. He's asking us to take his robe. And he even told the parable of the wedding feast that he gives his robe. And in the book of Revelation, all the saints are wearing a, a robe that covers all our nakedness. And all, all our filthy clothes that are nothing. So may you remember this loving image that God paints in the book of Revelation too. Uh, Pastor, I just want to say, Stephen, you know, if you uh, if you Google the refiner's fire story explains a guy goes to a refiner's place. Right. And he finds out he asks, why do you why do you keep it in the in the, the in the fire for so long? Why do you turn it? Why do you do this? And why do you do that? And, and it's basically in our lives. Why did God keep our feet to the fire? So to so to speak. Uh, when he wants to change things in our lives, he's, because he's burning off all the dross, he's, he wants to get all of this out of our lives. So look up that story. It's incredible how it's written. And I think it would help you a whole lot better to understand it. Yeah. Thank you, Gladys. Thank you so much. Refiner's thank you. Fire. The Refiner's Fire, yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I look forward to look it up for myself and i think it's just asking for a nice pastor, sermon domingo a refiner's fire yeah pastor can you hear me yes i can hear you now you can put in the screen also uh isaiah chapter 48 it started in starting in verse 9 so it is a it's a god of mercy and love that we we follow we don't god is not what he does in order to um save us at the end what he does with destruction it's not because it's what god is it's because it's what needs to be done in order to to the law for god to prevail as well yeah you can read that bible verse um just to add it to um some bible verses that people who have question can see that god primarily what looking for is mercy uh, uh upon us yeah, it says, uh, for my own sake and for the honor of my name, I will hold back my anger and not wipe you out. I have refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a... And then continue on verse 11. I will rescue for my sake. Yes, for my own sake. I will not let my reputation be tarnished and I will not share my glory with idols. That's right. That's right. So this theme of uh, refiner's fire is a big theme because obviously it, it tells us that God does not promise us an easy life. Uh, it's another subject, right? And so even our difficulties are like refiner's fire. That's right. And the probably the greatest difficulty and challenge in life is death 
and of course rebelling against God. And so God is that refiner, uh, refiner's fire. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, and this is New Living Translation. I'm sure that it probably sounds a little differently in, uh, in the New International or New King James. In the chat, some comments. I see, Stephen, you put the Revelation 14. Then Domingo says the proximity of the hell and heaven is not real. Uh, too close, so it cannot be taken literally. All right. that's Satan will die as he would not be happy in heaven. Agnes Usterhoff. And justice is not to have eternal life. Not to be with Jesus. That is the kind of, that's part of justice. Justice is not to have eternal life. What do you mean by that, Agnes? I know you're here. What did you mean by that? Well, he, he was, uh, Stephen was asking about justice. How can you give this as a justice? And this is the choice what you mentioned. If you choose not to be with Jesus, the justice is that you will not eat, have eternal life. And that to me is the, the biggest punishment you can have. If you cannot be with Jesus eternally, if you cannot have eternal life, that to me is the biggest way of realizing what you will lose out if you do not choose him and and the wicked or the the people who will not be in heaven will at a certain time realize i will not go to heaven i am i don't want to be there i've chosen not to be there but their biggest regret will be not to have eternal life and not to be with jesus did we see how how that worked on jesus when he when he was about to die that was his biggest fear not to be with his father. And that will be the a similar realization for people who will not go to heaven. I, 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 I agree with, with Agnes Pastor because uh, at the end of the day, even eternal life, it makes sense because we are going to be with Jesus. If we, Jesus is not part of the eternal life, it won't make sense at all. So we, we will lose out a lot. That would be the biggest loss and uh, any person, if you don't get eternal life with Jesus, it is your biggest loss. It's the biggest thing you can ever lose in your life. I, I just agree with, with the comment that uh, has been made. You know, I, maybe Elder Jake, would you be kind to pray? Heavenly Father, as we close our meeting, we praise you who are so good and deserving of all our love. We thank you for this Bible study that has revealed your true love. There are some, some thoughts on uh, that have uh, been disastrous as far as your reputation is concerned. And it's, it's wonderful that we have the opportunity through the Bible to, uh, to know what uh, your true justice is. We thank you for, for the people who are here tonight uh, we look forward, Heavenly Father, to our worship uh, on the Sabbath. And uh, we ask for your blessings and your love for the rest of uh, this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.